incredible landscape in Yellowstone Park. It is just so stunning and so interesting. And I would argue that the reason it is as stunning and interesting as it is is all because of the geology. I mean, the geology was controlling everything we saw today. Even, you know, the bison that are there eating because of the thermal um, the thermal waters that keep everything warm and allow them to hang out there. And the swans, the river didn't go. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've put together a little bit of information about the geology of Yellowstone and evolution of Yellowstone. Most of the images are from a field guide that you have a copy of. Um, so if there's anything you want to read more about, it's a great field guide. It's really clear and good. So um, first, we're going to zoom out and look at the western U.S. in the big picture. So this is a map of the western U.S. Um, and the triangles on this map show volcanoes in the western U.S. They don't show all volcanoes in the western U.S., but they show, they show ones that have been active in the relatively recent past or volcanoes that USGS considered significant to visit on children. So the first thing you can notice is that there's a whole string of volcanoes along the western side, the western edge of the US. And the reason, those are all stratovolcanoes that are related to subduction. So there's a, there's a plate, an oceanic plate that dips beneath the continental US, and you get melting and volcanoes kind of pop up through in a chain along the western margin of the continent. And that's all subduction related. So that's one style of volcano. But then if you look, there's a few volcanoes that are kind of anomalous places. Here's Yellowstone. Here is the Valles Caldera, or the Jemez Mountain Volcanic Field. And here is Long Valley Caldera. And those are not subduction related volcanoes. They are volcanoes that are, that are more in the interior of the continent. And Bill will talk a little bit more about why they're there in a minute. These three are the super volcanoes of the western US. So all three of these volcanoes have had eruptions that are over 500 cubic kilometers of magma, huge eruptions. And they've all erupted multiple times within the last two million years. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that the youngest eruptions from Yellowstone and the Valles Caldera are very, very similar in age. So the youngest eruption from Yellowstone is 70,000 years, and the youngest, um, sorry, yeah, Yellowstone is 70,000. The youngest eruption from the Valles Caldera is 65,000. Um, and both Yellowstone and the Valles Caldera have magma at them. They're still, you know, technically they're active volcanoes. Oh, sure. Here's the oceanic plate, a little thin, five kilometer thick 
uh, crust. Uh, and here's the bloom coming up under. And as the plate moved across, first it punched, punched through, made, made Hawaii. And as the plate moved along, successively made the other Hawaiian islands. And so uh, <coughs> that idea has, has been around, I think, since the 70s now. And, and fairly early on, people thought maybe that this, this same process is what's caused Yellowstone. There's been other ideas, but this idea is it's really held up pretty well. And the, the observation was made here that that Yellowstone is a supervolcano right up here, but that it's at the end of a chain of supervolcanoes that extends all the way to the uh, to the Nevada Oregon border, and that at about 16 million years there was a, a big outburst of, of uh, volcanism here, and kind of focused down, and then seem to travel along in this direction from Yellowstone to these various supervolcanoes getting younger and younger as you as you uh, march to the northeast. And it was also observed that the, that the apparent rate that this chain of volcanoes was shifting was about two and a half centimeters a year, which is about as fast as your fingernails grow. And that it exactly matched the, the magnitude and direction that the, that the American plate was moving. Um, with the idea being that at, at uh, some time uh, prior to 18 million years, there was this subduction going on, and that a, a plume, one of these plumes coming up from the mantle, was subducted. And first, as it, as it first impinged the, the thinner crust in this area, I mean, this is all younger crust, that it made the Columbia River basalts, a giant, a giant eruption of basalts, and then made this chain of volcanoes. This, this idea has really held up pretty well, and uh, is, is likely really what, what explains Yellowstone. And just uh, to put in a pitch for New Mexico Tech and the Argonne Lab, um, we, through time we did a lot of dating to help establish the ages of these calderas, and uh, in fact it dated, contributed to the dating of all of them except this one, dated more recently. And so, uh, since this time, uh, this is this is uh, zeroing in a little bit on the, the head of the plume where we were today, but the kind of the point of the spear of this progression of supervolcanoes. And, and one thing you can see here is that this is just a diagram of what we're seeing in the actual map is that as the plume progresses along, it seems to have this bow wave out in front of it, where it's distorting the continent. And this is this is this area here shown in green. It's 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 uplifted. It has a lot of faults and it has a lot of earthquakes. And that seems to be that the plume is pushing up against the continental crust and uh, and and, and uh, lifting it up even even well ahead of the, the Yellowstone caldera here. And that th this is kind of the key to, to how Yellowstone operates. This this area of high ground. Uh, attracts a lot of precipitation, and so it's a very wet area, and that, that contributes to the hyperthermal activity and also uh, to the glacial story that Steve Wells is going to talk about tomorrow. Um, well, one of the things that's helped uh, support this idea of a plume has been geophysical imaging. And by, by setting up arrays of seismometers and then looking at the time of arrivals of earthquakes from elsewhere in the world, kind of get a CAT scan through the crust of the earth and down into the mantle. And here's, a, here's kind of a, a, the shallower part of the plume that, that comes up at a slant and almost hits the surface here at Yellowstone. Here's another view deeper that shows it extending down way deep into the mantle. And so um, it, it, it seems like between the volcanic record and the geophysics, this idea of a plume is, uh, is a pretty strong idea. So the, the way that, that this ends up generating the volcanism that we see, I think that the plume is down here in the mantle, and it, it's rising, bringing up a lot of heat, and causing some melting at the top of the mantle of basaltic rock, which is iron-rich uh, 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 fluid magma then moves up in the crust and then slowly gets modified to form the rhyolite that we're seeing. And so crystals drop out of it as the, as the 
magma moves up, crystals drop out of it, it melts part of the crust, and as it works its way up into the crust, it's, it's, it's uh, being distilled in a way to form this rock that's, that's very rich in silica, silica and oxygen, that, and, and also rich in gas. As this happens, the gas is concentrated, and that uh, it, is what, it, is what uh, produces the very explosive kind of magma uh, volcanism that uh, we see in Yellowstone. <coughs> but what about the basalt? Where did it come from? Uh, the basalt comes from melting of the mantle. But in the Snake River, you know, in oh, the okay. after the after the plume has passed, see when the when you've got a rhyolitic magma chamber here, uh, you, the, uh, the the basalt can't get through, and only the rhyolite can erupt at the surface. Once the once the continent is kind of pushed on past the plume. Then these rising magmas, basaltic magmas that are still still melting, can make it to the surface, and there's your basalt right there. So all the like in the Snake River, that's all younger than the rhyolite. It's all younger than the rhyolite. And if I if I back up a little, uh, if you look at this chain of volcanoes here. There's super volcanoes. All these calderas, many of them can, you can't even see them at all. They're buried by basalt afterwards. And, and for a long time, the Snake River Plain was thought just to be this big basalt area, <laughs> like the Columbia River basalts. But they noticed that north and south of the Snake River, there were these rhyolite pyroclastic flows preserved. And, and you'd, find, you'd find little pieces of them along the way. And this is where geochronology and geochemistry helped match those up and, and realize that there must be calderas buried underneath the basalts. And since then, they've drilled through the basalts and found the calderas wow. beneath there. So, again, that, that part of the story seems to hold up. Um, when, most, when, when any, there's any, we've never seen a supervolcano eruption. Uh, they, they've all occurred in prehistoric times, so we're going to have to reconstruct what happened. And one of the things we believe, this is a, this is a stratovolcano here. This is a stratovolcano, and, and eruptions are similar but much, much bigger. Stratovolcanoes erupt uh, about 1 to 10 at most cubic kilometers in any single eruption, whereas the, the calderas are 500 to 5,000. But even when the stratovolcanoes erupt, some of the material is blasted up into the stratosphere and then rains out like snow as, as, a, as a pyroclastic fall ash. But Others, other parts of the, of the eruption have, are, are a mixture of pumice, ash, and gas, and it's too heavy to go up, so instead it flows out and sideways. And that's what's called a pyroclastic flow or, or an ignimbrite. And they can flow at the speed of sound. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, but once again, we've never seen one of these really big ones flow. But they, uh, the smaller ones, like at Mount St. Helens, had produced both ash and a pyroclastic flow, but it was measured to, or interpreted the movement as being sound at first, and then eventually slowed down. So these big caldera eruptions have two, two phases, the one that goes up, the ash fall, and the one that goes sideways, the, the uh, pyroclastic flow, or ignimbrite, which means hot, hot flowing rock. Hot <laughs> flowing cloud rock, it's a <coughs> Zealand term. <coughs> I'm just wondering, what kind of data indicates that it flowed at the speed of sound? Uh, Mount St. Helens? No, there's, there's, sure. it is, there's inference. There was a woman, it was Sue, what was her last name? Beard. Her last name Beard. It's anyway. inferred from damage to the bed under the ignimbrite, of right, some ancient ignimbrites. Yeah. And it's a, it was a modeling, a, there was damage damage observed, and then there was experimental work and modeling done to try to replicate that damage. And that allowed, it's, it's a, I'm blanking on her last name anyway, she's an incredibly brilliant scientist, and she's the one who did it. Okay, just curious. And, uh, and yet you can't report. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, this is, this is a, a diagram of how one of these caldera eruptions work. And this is, the scale here would be, if this was Yellowstone, Caldera would be maybe uh, uh, 50 miles across, so much, much, much larger than a stratovolcano. 
but you get you get a magma body rising up again, produced in the way we showed in the other slide, and it gets closer and closer to the surface. It domes the surface up uh, as much as a kilometer sometimes, and kind of stresses that top surface until it finally breaks, and then you get this huge eruption where the what was the the land surface actually shifts downward. And the reason is, is that you get so much material taken out of the magma chamber in the form of ash and ignimbrite that it's this emptied out down here and the top, boom, drops down like a big circular plug and forms this depression. And some of the ash that's, that's, that, that comes out pools in this depression. It's called an intracaldera tub. And, and that can be thick, that can be kilometers thick. And then some of it flows outward, which is this little line here. And, 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 and in the case of uh, Yellowstone, that's, you know, that's a thousand feet thick, 300 meters thick of, of flow. It, it, it started off as flow, a mixture of gas, ash, and pumice, flows across the countryside, goes down some drainages, up other drainages, and then when it eventually runs out of steam and, and, and uh, stops, so it's, yeah. it can be so hot that it can weld into a rock just as solid as the rhyolites that you see. And uh, that confused people for a while because they'd see these really solid rocks and they, they, they form these very thin sheets. And they, it, it didn't make sense because rhyolite lavas are, tricky, are typically big and stubby. But then they realized that it went through this pyroclastic phase and then welded into these sheets. But once, once the eruption is complete, you end up with this deep depression and then sometimes you get lakes forming in there, like in the bios called there, and there were lakes after it erupted. But then you all, it's still, not all the magma erupts, so you've still got some coming to the surface. And that can have the effect of pushing up the floor of the caldera. And that's what, that's what we see at Yellowstone in two areas, where there's uplifted uh, structural domes that have been pushed up. And sometimes that will expose the, the ignimbrite that, that uh, within the caldera, and that's what it does here. Uh, the, the only place within the Yellowstone caldera that you actually see that ignimbrite is where it's been pushed up in the domes. Because after, kind of after the eruption, during resurgence, and after, you get lava flows coming up these zones of weakness. You get, because you've got this ring fracture at the edge of this down drop block, and that's one place where lots of lavas come up. <coughs> And then also often the floor gets cracked up and you get more lavas coming up. And in the case of Yellowstone, the lavas, like we saw today at the last stop, uh, completely filled the crater, or the caldera. And you can no longer see what was the floor of the caldera right after the eruption. And so, um, if, if, in, in the picture showing the progressions of the caldera, each one is just shown as a circle. But actually, um, each of those calderas, most of them erupted more than once. Once, twice, three times, four times. In the case of Yellowstone, there were three big eruptions from the same caldera complex. The first one here at 2.1 produced a Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. And I'll show you that map after this of what came out of the caldera. This is just the caldera. Second caldera over here, 1.3 million years ago. And then the final caldera here, the uh, that erupted the Plum Creek Tuff is the one we were in today. Here's the resurgent domes when we were down by uh, Old Faithful, we were close to one of them. And the second one uh, is over where we're going tomorrow. I don't know if we'll see it or not. But is, it, is there evidence of resurgent domes in the other two eruptions? Uh, <coughs> it would be really hard to know that. It's, no. It's been so covered by lavas and that. I, I, if there is, I don't know about it. It's quite possible. Some calderas do not uh, do not have resurgence. Others have a whole lot. In the case of the Bios caldera, it's a, it's a big old dome in the middle of the, and it, it seemed to come up before the lavas, and, where, and then and the lavas followed. Here, it seems like the resurgence is still coming up even today. Could it be like like the original? I don't know. Uh, weak point or whatever. The, the yes. The heater. Yeah, that's where we, we think that the, um, as you'll see in the next slide, each of these three eruptions actually had multiple parts. 
in the case of the, the, the Lava Creek, there were the Lava Creek A, Lava Creek B, probably erupted within days, weeks, or years of each other, but one came from this area, one came from that area. So those were probably zones where there was more upwelling of magma than heat. Um, so what, what came out of these things when they erupted? And there are these big pyroclastic flow or, or, or ignimbrite sheets that extend uh, you know, up to uh, 100 kilometers or more from source. And so here's the first eruption, the, the Huckleberry Ridge eruption at 2.1 million. And there were the three big pulses and that seem to come from slightly different parts of the crater, A, B, and C. Um, and it's, uh, that it's, it's not uncommon for these Igibrite sheets to come out in these multiple pulses. And you'll, you can tell that they're multiple because one sheet will be welded, there'll be a welding break. You'll, you'll end up with a pile of, like, you know, in this area you have these three, three uh, deposits all on top of each other and but not welded together. I'm not going to point out some topographic control on the door. Yeah, you can see that as these erupted, they flowed out, uh, flowed into river drainages, and that's what these, that's what these uh, uh, big arms are coming off. And they, they can flow uphill, they can flow downhill because they've got a lot of momentum. Uh, second eruption here, smaller. This was this one is uh, 2,500 cubic kilometers, 2,500 times the size of. Mount St. Helens eruption. Is, is the chemistry the same in those eruptions? Slightly different. Similar, but slightly different. And you can often tell by the chemistry of the mineralogy which one you're in. And the trace elements. The major elements are fairly similar for all three, but the trace elements are by the part. Yeah. And, and, and so Mesa Falls at 1.3 looks like it was just one pulse. <coughs> and then <coughs> three, the youngest one that's most, that's most uh, best preserved here is not Lava Creek A, the lower member, Lava Creek B, the upper member. And if you if you microprobe the glass, this one's got 1.3% iron in the glass, this one's got 1.5. So if you can measure the difference, you can tell with the trace without trace elements mm -hmm. the majors. But, but the traces tell the story too. We think that these pulses happen very fast. These are the these are uh, age determinations uh, right here. You can't see the difference. Between the different the different pulses, if you look at the paleomagnetism, uh, they, they're just the same. If you look at the break between the multiple layers, there's there's no sign of erosion or uh, river sediments or anything. So we think that bam, 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 these things happen quite fast. When you say fast, you mean like within days of each other, or you mean in the geological? No, position, within like probably, in a, probably like days, centuries. probably days, weeks. If it was centuries, you'd start to see start to see erosion on this top surface of the lower one. You start to see rivers moving things around, and you don't see that. So literally, very quickly. Very quickly. Not even geologically. Not even geologically. Yeah. Quickly. It's, it's, there's, it, and uh, as far as I know, there's not been any good evidence found for a significant time break like years between them. Um, Bill? Well, yes? Why, why those two pulses like that? Why did it do that? Uh, good question. I think it's probably saying that you know our picture of the magma body as one big blob is probably not correct. It's probably more complicated. It's probably more complicated. And probably, uh, you know, and, and the upper part off to the west erupted first, and the lower part off to the east erupted second. And so, it's telling us that something is more more complicated is happening than just a single chamber uh, being evacuated in one shot. You think it might have to do with it let stress away over here and then conducted that stress over to another pulse or transferred energy from one to the other uh, through, the, through the crust? That, that certainly could be part of it. And that's certainly something that people are understanding more and more about earthquakes is that you know, earthquake over here at here. the lake is affecting the, uh, it's affecting the uh, uh, hot springs here in Yellowstone is or that, is there continuity of material or geologic structure between this? The crust, the, the crust is strong enough that it will it will transfer enough energy. And there's even thoughts that earthquakes can affect areas much further away, and that the famous Socorro earthquake in 1906, 
may well have been triggered by the California earthquake. Well, I, the reason I ask is that I think of Eugonio curves. Uh, you put an impulse in one material, and it creates a different impulse in a separate material. So if you want to boost something, you put it in one, and it can actually boost it in a, in a more dense material. So you transfer that energy more efficiently in a, in a denser, higher energy material, if you will. So going back to shock physics, which is kind of <coughs> what this is, I mean, you're dealing with the speed of sound, shock physics, and Eugonio curves uh, to see what impact it would have for neighboring structures. That, that could well be part of it. Also, you can imagine that that top plate above the magma chamber was deeply stressed right. by the eruption and the collapse, yeah. and, that, and that, that that could affect the, you know, the other side of the volcanoes. And there has been some really detailed geochemical work on an eruption in California from one of the other super volcanoes mm -hmm. that shows that originally, so you picture the, the the top of the caldera as a big disc, but in the initial stages of the eruption, it acted like a trapdoor, and then yeah. one side erupted, yeah. and then eventually really? the whole thing yeah. collapsed, and the other side erupted. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does seem like some some of these calderas tend to erupt right around the edges; others erupt out in the middle. So I think that you know, we're dealing with pretty inhomogeneous materials and, and different rock types, and so every caldera has kind of got its own. Personality, if you will. But um, so this this is, is uh, kind of where where we stood right after the eruption. But then post the the uh, oh, oh, here's a picture of the Ignimbrite, which we're going to pass this site tomorrow. I don't know how snow covered it's going to be, but this is uh, a 300 meters thick lava creek A, and again it erupted as a, a, a 900 say 800, 900 degrees C as pumice, ash, and gas. And at the bottom, it, it wasn't hot enough to weld. And there's gas cavities, liquefiable cavities, a lot of vapor moving around. But then uh, up higher, there's enough heat retained that it welded and there's this vitrophere zone, a zone of obsidian, like a layer of obsidian. And then above that, it gets very densely welded and, uh, and, and looks completely solid. Down at the lower part of this, you can dig it out with a rock hammer or shovel, no problem. Up at the top, you know, you, you break your hand if you're trying to break it. So, um, so oh, now, it's ash. now it's ash fall. This is, this is the other aspect of the, you know, the, the, uh, the initial big eruption is that some of the material went up and the other stuff took Yeah, so this is a nice link to New Mexico. So what Bill was talking about, the Ignimbrite, flows along the, the, the surrounding terrain. It usually gets you know, up to 100 or maybe a little bit more kilometers from source. But there's another component of these eruptions, which is the ash fall material. And you can see here that um, some of the material is flowing down the flanks, but then there's this lofting plume that's going up. And these plumes can get very, very high <coughs> in the stratosphere. And usually in a given eruption, about 10% of the material ends up going up really high and getting into the stratosphere and also being very finely fragmented. It's very, very fine grained material. And then it travels in the stratosphere. And these eruptions can blanket volcanic ash from this style of eruption is probably deposited around the entire globe. Now it may take a year or so for that ash to settle. And I also work on volcanic ashes in ice in Antarctica. And there's some eruptions that we find both in Antarctica and in the Arctic, which is really amazing. Um, so this is what the ash fall would look like close to source. And this is actually from the Valles Caldera, which is a place where I've worked a lot. And this is ash fall. And the really distinctive characteristic of ash fall is it's very bedded. And ash fall really is a lot like snow. It goes up in the air and then it comes down. And it mantles topography. So it won't be thick in the valley and thin on the hilltop. It'll be the same thickness everywhere. And you can see this nice <coughs> bedded material. This is meters <coughs> thick from your source. And here is a deposit near Sapporo of that same ash. So this is a few hundred kilometers to the south. And it's a much thinner deposit, but it still retains that bedding characteristic. So, um, I'm just going to click 
head of the earth. Here is the extent of the Lava Creek ash. And it went a long way. So Yellowstone, here's, here's the Yellowstone caldera. And this, this yellow circle shows the extent of measurable Lava Creek ash in the geologic record. So it covered a huge part of the western US. And, and I, I recently visited it right in Larrabee, Wyoming, over here. And it is 16 feet thick. Yeah. And one thing, so when Bill showed the pictures of the ignimbrite distribution, it was more or less a, a radial pattern around the vent. The ash bowl is not like that. And why is it not like that? Because it's really influenced by the wind. So it goes up into the atmosphere, and whatever direction the wind is blowing on that day, that's where the ash bowl goes. And some, some volcanoes will have one lobe of ash bowl that goes off one direction, and another lobe that will go another direction, just depending on where the wind is going. And I was talking about this to someone earlier today, and they said, how do you figure out what that ash is? I mean, you find a white ash <coughs> you know, in sediments in New Mexico. How do you know where that ash came from? And that is a tricky problem. And one of the ways we do that is using what's called geochemical fingerprinting. So what I'm looking at, what we're looking at here is a backscattered electron image from an electron microprobe at New Mexico Tech. And each of these little white pieces of material is a piece of volcanic ash. This is a 500 micron scale bar, so that's half a millimeter. That scale bar is half a millimeter. So most of these pieces are 100 microns or less. So they're, you know, a couple of human hairs in diameter. They're quite tiny. But we can do geochem... Oh yeah, another thing to see about this is you see that... You see these curved surfaces? That's because when the ash fall was erupted, the magma foamed. There were all these bubbles, and when it broke, when the bubble, when the, when the glass around the bubbles breaks, it forms these what are called triple junctions. So there would have been a bubble here, a bubble here, and a bubble there. And so this is just the septum between the bubbles. And you can see another nice example of that here. And that, oh yeah, here's a beautiful one here, triple junction. So that tells you it's an ash fall, a true ash fall deposit. And to know what volcano it's from, you do geochemical analyses of individual tiny shards. We usually do 30 or so, an average composition. And the cool thing about Lava Creek B, Bill said it has 1.5% iron. That's on average. The range of, of iron in Lava Creek B is 1.3 to 1.8 weight percent. And so when I analyze a volcano, an unknown volcanic ash and I see the iron start coming off the machine between 1.3 and 1.8, it's like, ah, oh, it's Lava Creek B, that's all you have to do. So, so each of these, ashes has its distinctive geochemical fingerprint that allows you to tie it to the source volcano. Does that make sense? How that works? Okay, back to Bill. So, so once, once the big catastrophic eruption occurred, it wasn't the end of the story. And this is, it's, it's very typical for when it, after a super volcano erupts, it starts, it, it follows it with uh, post caldera rhyolite lavas. And they're, they're probably from the same magma body, slightly modified after the eruption, but they keep working their way to the surface. And in the case of the Yellowstone 0.6 million year caldera for the Lava Creek Tuff, it's completely filled with lava, almost completely. It's a little bit showing around the resur this resurgent dome. but. Lava flow after lava flow uh, erupted, many of them like what we saw today, you know, very stiff uh, material, can hardly flow, doesn't travel very far from the vent, piles up as this, this lava dome. And again, there's a geologic jargon thing for you. These resurgent domes are completely different from the lava domes, even though they have the same name. Uh, resurgent domes push up, lava domes blow up and pile up. But, this, this whole process has just filled the entire caldera with lavas. And you see things like we saw today where the lavas are, are controlling where the rivers are. And then also the edge of the caldera also helps control where the rivers are. This is where we drove in today. And the Madison River was flowing right along here, right along that, basically paralleling the edge of this caldera. So these, these lava flows started erupting uh, very soon after the, uh, after the 630,000 year eruption. 
kept going until about 450 and then just totally quit. And, uh, and nothing happened for a couple hundred thousand years. And then at 250, uh, they started coming again. Big pumps around 100 to 150,000. And then the last, like the youngest ones at 70,000. Probably not done. Probably more will come out. But nothing in the last 70,000 years. Um, so now we're going to shift gears a little bit and, and start and, and talk about the hypothermal activity, what we were seeing today. And this is a map. There's the caldera. There's the uplift areas uh, you saw before, and lots of hot spring deposits shown in in orange, in uh, in uh, green, and then new in purple. And there's there, there's uh, there's different chemistries. Most of what we saw in terms of what, what forms the uh, <coughs> hot springs and the boiling lakes, anything really wet is this uh, it, it's, uh, alkaline chlorine, chloride chemistry. And we, we think that, that we know that the, the heat flow in Yellowstone is so high that the, the crust gets ductile about five kilometers below the surface. But there are lots of cracks penetrating down to that depth. And so there's, uh, there's so much water, because this is such a high limit with high precipitation, that the water percolates down. It gets heated up, and there's, there's, there's a, a layer of brine, a deep layer of brine, down from, what, five kilometers to two kilometers. And then that mixes with the meteoric water, and gets heated up, comes back to the surface, and, and forms most of the, most of the uh, hot spring deposits that are shown in green here. Um, there are places, like we saw today, in this orange spot, where uh, there's where the rock is broken up enough that steam can rise off of the hot water below the surface. And when the steam, uh, when the, the, the hot water flashes to steam, a, a couple, it, it changes in composition. Because it, it, a lot of what we saw in the, in the uh, in the, uh, some of the hot spring deposits were, were silica. There's a lot of silica uh, dissolved in this water. It comes to the surface, forms, uh, and, and it's, it forms these, these silica crusts like we saw around the lakes. But when steam rises off of that and the rocks above that, it can't take the silica with it. It, it's, it leaves it behind. But it does take hydrogen sulfide. It, it partitions into the steam. It's oxidized into sulfuric acid, and then that, that forms these acid sulfate waters, which uh, when the deposit silica, they dissolve the rocks that they need, and you get mud pots and, uh, and paint pots and mud volcanoes and things like that. So those are two, two kind of different deposits you get. It's fully controlled by, this, by, by whether it's the, the, the hydrothermal fluids are water, are liquid, or, or steam chemistry changes when they turn to steam. There's a little third type here. Uh, some of you have been up to Mammoth Hot Springs, and there, there uh, the, the acidic uh, hydrothermal fluids are interacting with limestone, like Madison limestone, dissolving it, and then that gets deposited at the surface as carbonate. And that's where you get these big travertine mountains, which we, we're not going to see on this field trip, but uh, they're worth seeing if you have uh, some of the some of the geothermal features. There's the grand prismatic prismatic uh, pool. Here's sinter terraces forming. Here's a boiling lake. Those are all formed by this alkaline chloride chemistry, by the by the wetter version of the thermal fluids. Whereas the mud pots are from the acid sulfate. And uh, this this not depositing sil silica, but is dissolving the rock, turning it into clay. And you probably noticed today when we were by the mud pots, you could smell that sulfur. Yeah. Another another uh, <coughs> uh, form of uh, hydrothermal activity is. Uh, and, and you want to talk about this a little bit? Or? Uh, <laughs> you can want. Uh, you go ahead. You, you talk about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, geysers are a little complicated. But anyway, we saw Old Faithful today. And Old Faithful is a geyser that erupts on a very regular schedule, and they can predict very accurately when it's going to erupt based on the magnitude of the previous eruption. So it's, it's quite a regular system. 
And again, geysers are uh, they're a little bit mysterious, but what has been recognized about geysers in Kamchatka and geysers in Yellowstone is that they're not just a simple conduit. They're not just a simple pipe that has hot water coming out of it. So a hot, wa a, a hot water lake or a hot pool would be a simple pipe, just leading, bringing water up from depth. Geysers always have an associated side chamber with them. And water is coming up into that side chamber and bubbles are forming. So the, the waters are very hot and there's either bubbles of CO2 or there's boiling. And these bubbles accumulate in the top of this side chamber. And they accumulate progressively over a period of time. And then when eventually there's enough bubbles in that side chamber that the whole thing just starts to flush out the main chamber up to the geyser. So you get more and more and more bubbles in the side chamber and eventually that connects to the main conduit kind of at this join here. As soon as those bubbles start to escape up the main conduit, you get a pressure wave and everything flat, and there's a big flashing event where there's a lot of steam form. So all of a sudden it's like shaking up a, a bottle of seltzer water and uncapping it. First you just had liquid and all of a sudden you have liquid and a whole lot of vapor and it's not going to fit in that space anymore, so it shoots out. So that's my somewhat simple-minded explanation of how geysers work. If anyone has any better insight into how geysers work, please speak up. But this is, this is what I read in one of the most recent papers about geysers. So they're complicated. And again, Yellowstone has two-thirds of the world's active geysers, which is wonderful. And at least in some geysers, People have sent down a man submersibles who've seen these side chambers. Yeah. So in Kamchatka, they sent an unmanned camera down, checked out the side chamber. Here they uh, they they've um, seen it geologically, and many of the guys in Yellowstone have side chambers. But I think probably the periodicity of the guys has something to do with the size and geometry of that side chamber. And interestingly, the active volcano that we work on in Antarctica, called Mount Erebus, which erupts periodically, I think has a very similar plumbing system. So it's magma and gas instead of water and gas. So, will. question on that. Uh -huh. On the event side. I won't be able to answer, but <laughs> that's okay. Because <laughs> I, I, I find it interesting. How come it doesn't get, the constriction does not continue to get constricted further and get deposits because of the difference of temperature and deposit, very much like a chimney and creosote buildup? That's a I, I, I wondered about yeah. that. I think, I think the geyser must self-clean it. It must self-clean, okay. yeah. It, it's, it's abrasive enough where it just cleans it and the high temperature and pressure? That's I, what I would guess. That's okay. what I would guess. And, and certainly, these geyser systems are just right on the edge of existing. Yeah. It doesn't right. take much to uh, to shut them off, say, in earthquakes. Well, I, I saw off. the one at Pork Chop Geyser where it <coughs> exploded and they had to vent. Yeah. And you can tell where the vent almost looked like it had changed over a period of time, but not constricted off. And I thought that was rather interesting that it doesn't choke itself it, out. It's and sometimes the opposite happens. It blows that constriction out, and then it just turns into a hot spring. And it's not okay. that yeah. But it's amazing how consistent Old Faithful yeah. has been for a really yes. long time. Yeah, long time. Whereas Erebus, the active volcano in Antarctica, Every year, it's got slightly different periodicity, which I think has to do with the shape Shaking of that the chamber. Yeah, the chamber. Huh. Yeah, has anyone like, studied the possible age of old faithful? Um, I, haven't seen anything. I haven't seen anything on it. Good, good question. I wonder if you could do it based on the dome. Based on the yeah, I mean you can. It's got that. It's got that uh, center pile. It, the carbonate ones up at Mammoth are easy to date. Yeah. Because you can, use, they've got a little bit of uranium in it. And you can use uranium lead it's, it's, uh The silicones might be more difficult to date. But uh, there is another feature that we'll, we haven't really seen, but what we will are these explosion craters, and they're all over Yellowstone. They're much bigger at Yellowstone. They seem to be bigger than the New Zealand explosion craters. They tend to be maybe 100, 200 meters across. The Yellowstone ones are up to 2.5 kilometers. And the, 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 the interpretation of, of how this happens is that you've got a hot spring, it's depositing silica, it builds up on the top until it, it, it makes an impermeable cap. And it, it basically plugs the top, like we're talking about. 
pressure builds up, pressure builds up, and then either the top fails, is under, under the pressure from below, or there's an earthquake that cracks it, or the other thing that can happen is that during the, during the glacial period, there were, there were ice, ice dam lakes that uh, formed and drained, and these, the drainage can reduce the pressure on the system and boom. And so there's these, these are probably one of the greater hazards in the park right now. They've, they've been observed to form in certainly 1925, there was one, and, and they, could, they could really, any of these thermal areas, you know, with everybody around it in the summer, but it's uh, it's it's a worry <laughs> and, and probably very difficult to predict. You know, volcanoes usually give you some amount of warning. You know, there'll be earthquake swarms before they explode, but I'm not sure these explosion craters would do the same. Uh, Lake Yellowstone, which I don't think we're going to see on this trip, is interesting because. Uh, it's, it's also got these thermal features, but they're underwater. And uh, there's uh, the USGS people have done a lot of work with submersibles and side scan radar, side scan sonar under the lake. And they, they find not the same features that are at the surface, under, underwater, uh, underwater fumaroles, underwater explosion craters, and then these underwater spires of, of silicon that have been thrown above like black smokers in the ocean. Road above the, you know, the underwater hotspots. There, they, there's hundreds of them under the lake, but you wouldn't know. Uh, this, this, it's, this part of the lake, uh, it was formed by a uh, an explosive, a small explosive rhyolitic eruption. It's like a mini caldera before that. Uh, and there's, there's, uh, it's another late stage explosive event, but it's the. Uh, so it's a good story if you find to go down there to submersible and really see those things. And, and somewhere around, of course, you guys are uh, facing there, there, there's silk aspires that they think root beneath the lake and are like, just later drained and, and they're, they're out on land now. So is that like tooth from What's that? Like tooth from Mono Lake? Uh, same idea. So, the Tufa Towers. Um, in terms of kind of ongoing processes today in Yellowstone, uh, one of the big ones is uh, uplift and subsidence. And this is a uh, satellite uh, interferometry uh, 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 image showing this big area of uplift within the, within the caldera. One of them centered on, on the northeastern Resurgent Dome, and then a big area of downdrop uh, in the Norris area, and it, 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 these, uh, it, this, it, this just is, uh, I think, two years of observations, and each of these bands is 28 millimeters of uplift, but since, they, since they've been building roads in the park since 1923, they've done leveling studies, and parts of the park have come up since, since that time uh, over a meter, a meter and a half, uh, and then other areas have been observed to, to come up uh, you know, many, many centimeters and then drop back down. And uh, the, the explanation for the uplift is, is magma coming in from below, the same thing that drives the resurgent domes. But it appears that sometimes it'll, it'll pick the land up and then hydrothermal fluids will, will flow out uh, away from that high and then they'll drop back down. And so in just a period, small number of years, you know, there's a big uplift and, and down drop. Yellowstone. So you're saying the magma may be mounding and the groundwater as it were flowing away so it could be actually getting worse than pulling us on the surface? It could be pulling us on the surface a little bit? Uh, it's, it's certainly it's moving the hot water out away from the center. Yeah. Because yeah. the magma is actually coming up higher but it doesn't look yeah. like it's yeah. But, yeah. but, the but then at the same time the magma is bringing in more heat so it's it's what's driving this whole thing. So I think I think parts are going up, parts are going down, parts are getting hotter, parts are getting cooler, and, and sometimes it happens very fast. Like after the 1959 earthquake, uh, just uh, just out to the west of us, you know, all kinds of geysers and hot springs either started up from fresh or shut down, and water levels changed, and so uh, it's very it's a fragile system. Uh, and uh, here's here's a shot of the there's the park and 
these are recorded earthquakes within the park. It's on the order of 2,000 earthquakes a year within the park. Uh, most of them small ones, probably related to uh, movements of hydrothermal fluids, but then a few really big ones, the biggest one being this uh, Hebgen Lake uh, earthquake of 1959, which uh, Cause some people in the room to be born. But <laughs> <laughs> so it was not only not only did it affect uh, hot springs, but it affected people. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll see more of that. And I think that's it. That's I have a earthquake alert on my phone for over three. What's that? I have a I have an earthquake alert on my phone for over three. Yep. And there's a lot. Some of these earthquakes are purely tectonic, you know, or faults. Others are, are from hydrothermal fluids moving. Others are from magma moving. And so I don't, I don't know about those. Thanks so, for your attention. And yes, hey, thanks. Thanks for your <laughs> 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 <laughs>